Well, the, the, the game we're talking about was uh, designed for a competition where there mm -hmm. were specific constraints that were placed on it and also a very limited period of time that we had to put this together. So, I mean, I found the, the constraints uh, useful to kind of, you know, work, work within and, and get the, the piece together. But obviously at this point, those constraints are no longer there. Right. Um, so so you can the question is whether to say the constraints were a good thing in the first place, let's more or less keep them, or shall we fly and be free and reconceive and all the rest of it. Um, how did that how there were four of you involved, right? Five? Uh, there were more than that. Yeah, there was were, a whole bunch of names there. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is in terms of continuing to develop the game how is that going to work or happen? What is the, okay. who, who is planning on this? Who is talking about it? I don't mean like specifically by name. doesn't really matter. I'm talking about this. What kind of endeavor are we talking about? Okay. So, so the, the people who worked on the game, uh, I'm a school teacher. And so uh, I let people know, oh, there's this game chef competition and it's very limited time. And but maybe we get a team together and and kind of collectively work work on this. And so uh, it was uh, another teacher at the school who joined in, and then oh, I'm counting seven students who joined right. in. Right. So um, yeah, go ahead. And so uh, you know we had nine days to put it together, and I found I mean the team it, it worked really wonderfully. Where you know kind of the brainstorming and everything, and and kind of trying out different ideas uh, in terms of how that, how ideas would work out with uh, mechanics of the game. Um, you know, most of the people who did this, it, it was strictly for the, the, the game chef competition and, and that was it. Um, you know, after the game chef competition, there are a couple of members of the team who said, boy, that's a really, that was a really interesting game we put together. There actually have been people on campus who have played the game after the competition. So after we were kind of like doing right. the play testing for the competition uh, and they were really enjoying uh, the game. And so uh, right now I'd say that there probably are me and, and a couple other people who are interested. I have sent out an email to the team saying, look, uh, some of us are thinking it might be worth continuing to work on it. Uh, would everybody be okay with that? And um, everybody said, yeah, that would be fine. So, I think most uh -huh. of them are just like, oh, you know, fine, work on it. Um, and I also put in there that, look, any, you know, wh whatever the final version of this is, in terms of the authors, everybody's going to stay on as an author and right. write. Well, let's, uh, I'm, I guess I, I didn't quite phrase that. I'm more interested in just knowing how many people are involved going forward. So you and two others? Yeah. Okay. So that means that whatever we talk about today um, will be more or less relevant to, to the other people. In other words, to some people might find it valuable, someone else might not. So, um, so that's just with that proviso. You know, you're going to be taking this to other people and who knows what they'll say. All right. Well, with um, with the first step, um, I have a couple of pretty profound and disturbing uh, considerations. Uh, one of them, well, I don't know how profound. I just said it was profound. I don't know. I think they're a little bit profound. One is that people have tried for a very long time to have a game where you, quote, make a story that has structural and thematic punch at the same time as some kind of strategic and competitive play among the players is involved. One of the most famous was called Once Upon a Time, which was published by Wizards of the Coast um, in the 90s, in at least two editions, maybe three. And then there's been a number since then, and it's kind of a holy grail. You get people together and you say, we're going to play in a fashion that people are very, very familiar with from 
you know, from all kinds of games where we have points and cards and tokens and procedures and steps and phases and things, and someone wins. It's going to turn out that someone wins, and it's also going to be at least influenceable. You can actually look back causally and see that they won. So that's going to happen. And that the aesthetic, the driving aesthetic at work is that we care about the story that we're making. We care about the characters. We care about what's happening. We experience their rises and their falls. We experience the climactic moments as if we were creating slash enjoying fiction. I say Holy Grail because I really don't think anyone's done it. Um, once upon a time floundered through its various editions chewing on the nut of making that happen and from different angles and not succeeding. At Italy, as a matter of fact, uh, there was a raft of games, mostly with cards, not entirely, but mostly with cards, that uh, were very much in this, this mode. And we played a ton of them in the evenings because we really wanted to investigate, hey, maybe somebody's figured this out at last. Maybe it's possible. Uh, maybe, you know, <laughs> then we can be so pleased that Ron was wrong about narrativism and gameism, right? We can, wait, hooray. And so it'll be great as long as we play hard, compete hard, strategize hard, and yet love our story and joy, take joy in our developing fiction, it'll be great. I don't think it's happened. Um, and I would be just as pleased to be replayed, uh, proved wrong as anybody. I played the hell out of the best version of Once Upon a Time. And we could make it work only if we completely borked the winning thing. We just said, forget it. We're just not going to play for the win. We'll let the cards run out and the combinations occur. And if you have an ending card, instead of slapping it down when you're legally permitted to do it, you're just going to use that ending card when it really hits you that this is the way to go. And we all accept that your ending is the ending, but we're all happy that anybody did that. And then we would have a good time. Or we would play for the win, and we accepted that our story was often absurd or cut off or stupid or too long or anything um and we just accept that that's that's just what you had to do you had to not care about that so um the same thing occurred with a lot of the other ones and a, a particularly annoying or disturbing trend has occurred in them where you're <laughs> guaranteed of getting a beautifully structured story particularly with phases of play you're guaranteed of getting a perfect structure but the fact is, is that you can't fail to do so. And no matter what the hell anybody actually ever says, it'll happen. In other words, it's, it's, it's monkey proof. In which case, you just lost the battle by winning the first. I mean, you just lost the war by winning the first battle. You know, okay, we made it monkey proof. You're going to get a story no matter what. Well, guess what? You just ruins the ability for us to create a story. So, um, and we saw a bunch of those. There were a whole ton of them. They often had a fairy tale motif, and they often had a lot of whimsy, and they often had a lot of improvisational creativity. But they really didn't have uh, a way for you to generate fiction in the sense of experiencing the rising action and experiencing the climactic moments there would be there was a moment at the end where the child had to decide whether to do this or do that and in and really it didn't really make any difference um to anything so my argument is that here this long preamble is what are we doing with waiting rooms at this level and looking at it and and this is the problem if one is doing all one's playtesting with people who are agreeing on that aesthetic, for example, the enjoyment of the story and the enjoyment of a legitimate vote at the end regarding the nature of the universe and stuff like that, and not really caring who is the last man standing, or rather gets whoever gets to go, not really caring who, as long as we look at it and say, wow, our collective notions of, you know, 
rising action at the time of play and our collective notions of judgment at the end. Yeah, it makes sense, Bob, that your dude is going to go off to heaven. That's the kind of universe we made together. Cool. If that's the prevailing aesthetic, then it will be a rude, rude day, a very bad day in hell when you sit down with your published game and are confronted with a bunch of people who say, oh, cool, how do I win? And do it. Completely by the rules. And they say right here, it says right here, you win that way. And you're sitting there going, holy shit. They, these people don't get it. And the answer is no, they get it perfectly. They get it better than you do. And so, um, and so that's what I'm kind of, that, that's what I was talking about. This is a, a difficult and dangerous thing to ask because you, my thinking 25 years ago with Once Upon a Time was who on earth would ruin the game by doing that? Who on earth would take this beautiful, whimsical little storytelling card game and ruin it by winning? And again, the answer is that I'm my opinion in that regard is remarkably outvoted by reality. The answer is most people. So especially if that's what you say it's going to do. Um, to take a slightly different example which I think is a valid one, is Murderous Ghosts by Vincent, which I think is an excellent, excellent game. But Vincent, in his zeal regarding the notion that people will always come to a highly localized and customized creative agenda whenever they play, that's kind of his ideal, he says, well, you know, I can use language like winning in Murderous Ghosts, and everybody will just interpret that to mean what they want, and it'll be cool. How could it go wrong with just two people? Um, and so that's really, so that's the first concept that I wanted to kind of get across that even though it may not have shown up in your play tests so far, it's lurking. Well, I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can say, I don't know that it's shown up in the play tests, but when we were designing it, I would say the most heated argument that we got into. I mean, there was one of the days that of those nine days that we had. One of those days. <laughs> one of those was the day when everyone was going to go home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and, and it went, and it was precisely over the the matter of you know uh, us you know figuring out that okay, so you have this idea that there's a judgment, and um, I, I need to go back, and I I don't know that we say when per se, but I mean, there is it's this idea. It's real close. Yeah. 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 Um, and so it's like, okay, so yeah, we, we, we became kind of very much aware ultimately uh, that, you know, you might have a player or a group of players who say that's the goal of it is to survive the final judgment. And then you might have another group of players that gets into kind of putting this, fiction together but now the play tests that we have done and that they, they've been uh with different groups on campus um i mean some of whom really don't play that many games but uh the the play tests it has the players have gone to the 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 fiction side of it which right? is I a mean, good they, sign it may be that the way you've presented it and then aspects of the rules Particularly because there's really no way to anticipate the judgment very far. Correct. And so, and, um, yeah. so that may and, and, it may be that you're in good shape. Yeah, I mean, you don't, you can't anticipate the judgment. And the other thing is that the story is going to getting built by all these other players who are answering these questions. And so, even if there was somebody at the table who said, "Oh, my objective is to try to." kind of work this out so that I survive the judgment and that was their complete motivation uh you know if they're sitting around a table with a bunch of other right. people that they they um you know and and I I think the other players my sense is that the other players would recognize oh this person is like saying things when they're responding to these questions that are really not geared to creating the fiction and 
I, I have not seen that situation right. emerge, but right. I, I I would just imagine that that right the other right. players would One, say, well, you're, yeah. Well, yeah, they, you're, you're, they may or they may not. In my experience, gamers are not very good at calling that out. But the uh, but more importantly, we we shouldn't think of this as like what if there's a bad person with a pathological view who sneaks in. I'm talking more about this as something that people do that is actually a pretty regular and understandable thing to do. And um, furthermore, that with Once Upon a Time, you also can't anticipate anything from most of the game. It's only toward the end when the deck is dwindling down and people have a lot more ending cards in their hands with different criteria that that kicks in. And then the fiction flounders very fast. Well, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that Looking at the playtest so far is a really good good indicator of how much of an issue this is. But more than one game which has survived that level of playtesting, including outside playtesting, has hit those very same rocks. So that's that's the only thing I, I'm thinking of. Um, it may be a matter, if anything, I mean maybe nothing. But if anything, then it may just be a matter of having what happens to the characters at the very end be less survivorish. Because really, is that very important that only one gets to go? I mean, is that even very important as a as a thing? And um, I would argue not. So those are just again, this is not a recommendation, and it's just to think about. And again. Play, play testing experience, judgment of others, not in the bad sense, um, will play a role in what you decide to do. But as long as the issue is front and center and you already saw it arise during design, um, and to remember again that we're not talking about bad power gamers and bad people and, you know, griefers or anything like that. Um, Okay, so that's one thing. One question. Um, yeah. Does it help? Now, Now, with the way the game is set up right now, more than one people could survive their final judgment, right? So it's not set up so that necessarily just one person gets to pass through the I'm trying to remember. If the, I've, I've read through it and tried to, try to do the little thing, but now I either didn't understand that or I got the wrong impression somehow um, that... How is it that more than one person gets to go to Nirvana well, or wherever? Okay, so you 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 accumulate your karma tokens right. uh, during the game, and then at the very right. final oh, that's stage, right. if it's heaven or hell, then if you have more heaven, you go. Period. Correct. Right. right. And if it's Nirvana, then it's who's ever most balanced go. Right. Right. Um, there are. But, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, more than one person could be right. like if if right. if you're working under one system, more than one person could uh, when they balance out their karma tokens could uh right right yeah, okay so right. perhaps that plays a big role in it um that if the the phenomenon still occurs but the one winner aesthetic which is very very powerful very overriding especially toward the end you're like wait what do, now we're in end game what do we do oh oh one of us okay then you know people kick in real hard there and if that's not really, you know, the issue, then, then good. Um, but the chance for that to slide into slippery slope because the, the, the key of, as I like to say, it's actually not about winning that kind of play. It's about not losing. And so that still applies, possibly. So, all right, with that in mind, let's take a look now at the fiction itself. Um, and I'm really interested in what you've observed people to make. What are the stories that have occurred? And I'm very interested in how people have interpreted the textual rule to answer questions truthfully and bluntly, considering that what they're being asked is not based on any personal experience, evidence, or anything except the fiction that the person is inventing by answering. So how could, I mean, I think I get it, but, I will not, but I'm, I'm asking for a reason. I think I get it, but in purely literal verbal terms, it is impossible to answer either truthfully or untruthfully. 
So what have you observed people to do in the most successful play that you've participated in or seen in terms of that exact rule? Because without that in play, I don't want to play. Mm -hmm. So what is it? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, get, I think one reason why we put the truthfully and bluntly there is so that because the idea is that the the idea is that the people who are here they don't remember their pasts but they do know they get the sense that the other characters slash players are people that they knew somehow in their previous life and so when you're answering the questions around the table uh, you are establishing facts about yourself, but those facts are also facts that the other players need to know because part of... Well, yeah, I mean, we're going to ask more questions game. at the very least. Right, and you um, should be trying to build up relationships right, with the right. other players because even though you know you knew them, you don't know specifically... So when you say what truthfully, whatever I say is not being tested against my sense of internal truth, what you mean is that it will now become true in the fiction. Correct. Right. And, and that, so that, uh -huh. that other players then can kind of take that. If somebody has already right. said it, that then... Nobody has to worry about it turning out to have been a lie. Correct. Right. Um, because that would be madness. Right. Okay, so, um, so that actually works pretty well. Now, again, I'm really interested in examples of fictional outcomes from these mechanics. What has happened? Okay. First of all, if if the group the group has a has a choice to make at the beginning as to whether they want to define the kind of world that they are in or that they came from or whether they want to exclude certain things. It's like, oh, we don't want it to be a science fiction thing or we don't want it to right, be you're talking that's you're talking now about sort of genre trappings and tropes and stuff, right? Correct. Okay. If if you don't set those up at the beginning, and the play tests that we've done, I don't think that any group has done that. I mean, that they that they just said, well, okay, we'll just see what, what happens. What ends up happening is that the first people answering the questions get a lot of power. Sure. Because uh, like one of the games that I played, um, I had one of the first questions asked to me and it had to do like, what, you know, what was my memory of, you know, waking up in the morning okay and so my memory of waking up in the morning was of taking a shower but the shower was some type of petroleum product that was a lubricant that was like you know and, and it was clear that i was like some type of android right, robot right. type thing and, and so and that was right there at the beginning so now that that's a fact sure that, but okay, we're, but I'm we're not that, that interested. That's actually not what I was asking about. I was asking more about specifically those relationships and mm -hmm. those dramatic moments of character decision that are revealed through traversing rooms. And um, I'm interested in those story terms rather than genre or setting or trappings. So who did you guys discover fractured love affairs did you discover political crises did you discover yeah. murders did you discover you know, dude, that's kind of what i'm what i'm interested in uh yes um there are you know if i mean that particular game did go into a whole kind of uh, a, a society that was very politically stratified and there were some characters that were at the top of the pecking order who were obviously then hated by those who were lower down on the pecking order. And it was a very, I mean, not only was it stratified, but it was a, a very kind of fascist, right. dictatorial type society that kind of emerged out of that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I think players have enjoyed when given you know opportunities to establish relationships of of thinking the of those in 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 pretty dramatic and often kind of conflict based terms. well that's I, I suspect that the question asking often frames it in that fashion you know mm -hmm. uh 
Did you hate anyone there? Did you love anyone there? Were you killed there? Um, mm -hmm. You know, did you dream of something different at that time? I can imagine any number of questions that would generate that kind of thing. What right. kind of questions did you did you observe people to ask? Um, well, I mean, the, the question the questions are are based on the cards. Uh, well, so that's you right. You see, I don't have the cards. Yeah. So therefore, I was. Uh, I, that's why I'm spitballing, is because I, I actually don't have them. Yeah. So. Um, Okay, so the cards go into different decks. Yeah, but like different one, colors. One deck is specifically con conflicts, and right. those th there are some questions that are not really relationship questions per se. They're just like facts about you that you remember from your previous life. There are other cards that do ask, you know, these kinds of relationship type. Uh, question so i and the conflict deck in particular has some of those so i mean to give you an example of some of these um one question what did you do to embarrass me in front of my friends and that that one is automatically going to kind of trigger right. uh, I mean, some memory the, the, and, and, yeah. and those two then right. those two people now involved in this conversation mm -hmm. are uh kind of building up uh, a relationship and then the person who has answered that question uh, returns with the question back to the first questioner what did you do to escalate our feud well there you go I mean you even stuck a noun in there I mean mm -hmm. to to provide the context already um, that's interesting too because here we are moving into territory that is a, a, again like some of the criticisms I was making earlier Given that a question would contain, yes, we are or were in a feud. And that's just a given. Uh, the first one, you know, what did you do to embarrass me? What did you do to embarrass me in front of our friends? Doesn't presuppose a fixed resulting relationship. You might have forgiven the person. You might have you know, thought it was pretty funny yourself. You might have, you know, even when you were embarrassed, whatever. The second question goes ahead and gives you content. There's a feud because mm -hmm. of this, presumably. And it says escalated, so causality is there. So, in other words, the cards, at least in that case, and I wonder if there are more, contain not just prompts, but content. And once that starts happening, how much of this becomes a little bit like the novel Hopscotch, where you can read the chapters in any order, um, or I can't remember if it was any order or was it, whether it was uh, two designated orders. I think it's two designated orders. Um, and you get two different stories. Um, and that's a little bit like a lot of the games that we played this last week where there were tons and tons of interesting little cards and interesting little choices you know pick two of the three or something but the fact is that it was considered a virtue of the design that you could have any combination of the cards you might draw and you could use them wherever and whenever i mean even if it was little organized like you guys have it organized by the, the topics and colors um these other games also sometimes organize them a little bit these are the cards you draw in this location these are the cards you draw in that location but regardless whatever choices you have in that condition or from that deck the fact that it's always usable is not necessarily a plus um it 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 creates the situation, as I was trying to describe before, where you end up with some kind of a structured story and you get to color it, shape it, act it out, but you don't actually get to make it. Um, some Nordic LARPing has this quality in which, for example, uh, four or five acts of a play like structure are set up this is the discovery 
No, well, this is the temptation scene. This is the uh, estrangement scene. This is the infidelity choice. And this is the aftermath after your partner finds out. But there are choices in there which allow you to shift around and act out and improvise in such a way. The actual culpability of it all is can be changed depending on the group playing. And also whether the observer might think the infidelity is a good thing or a bad thing is also left more open. And I actually found that those tended to fall flat because people were afraid to go off trope. They would, you would see stuff that you were familiar with seeing in plays and movies, and you would also see stuff that people were personally good at acting. So somebody who was good at being the snotty teenager, or someone who was good at being the harpy-like wife, or someone who was good at being the indecisive guy, would, would do those things. So, um, so on, on those circumstances, again, there was a, there was a fail-safe there that I actually think was not really all that good a thing. So I guess what I'm asking is, what kinds of diversity of fiction did you see from different groups playing at different times? Uh... I, th I think a lot of diversity. I mean, I, I got, I had one group of, of students that just went, uh, well, I mean, they, they went uh, Harry Potter with it and, and had, it, it wasn't Harry Potter per se, but, you know, they, they, but it, it was, you know, that kind of setting. And beyond that kind of setting, they, they were obviously kind of then bringing the relationships already kind of in mind that they got from, that particular both universe as well as the narrative and so right. that they were kind of already kind of bringing to it well this. i guess what i'm talking about is more in terms of the questions at the end what kind of universes have people come up with in that game for example what kind of universe was it was it heaven and hell was it nirvana that group now that was a group that started playing it during lunch and they never okay finished that up the the one with the the really um <coughs> fascist right. setup um that one i think ended up being the proletariat there there's like a proletariat mm -hmm. uh karmic universe um which interestingly enough it read to me rather than proletariat it read more bourgeois in terms of describing the 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 virtues but that's just my interpretation well, well and that was interesting because uh i think when it came to the weighing you say the proletariat it should be the the ones that are really trampled down that right. would that would kind of survive the weighing but it ended up being the case that that with the way that the the, yeah. the, 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 the weighing worked out yeah the adjectives the, didn't match proletariat at all they match they match middle class yeah um, yeah but uh so I, that doesn't surprise me um, but okay, so that one went that way. What about some of the others? Um, I know that we can't expect in nine days of playtesting to generate all the possibilities. But what happened, and uh, I was really interested in the, uh, again, maybe this is my poor reading, but there was a nice silence in the rules at the ending regarding the existential outcome. Yeah. It was the one that gave you no directions about what to do with anybody. Right. Which I quite like, of course, because that's precisely, <laughs> you know, what, what, what you would expect. And so, um, but that stated, it's interesting to, it, it, that one definitely sticks out. That's the thumb mm -hmm. of, of the possibilities because either you throw your hands up in the air and say, I don't know what the fuck the universe means anyway. You know, or you sort of stroke your chin and say, well, you know, I think we have an existential universe here. And those are actually kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of like that, um, that that possibility is there. 
and it's and that's one of the features that lead me to be optimistic about its viability in other words you you really do have if you will an escape clause for what this is all about that is a good escape clause it's not a desperation device it's a it's an actual option um i'm I would say that also with the play test, the, the, the dualist option, um, we, we had one play test that we did where we had a group come in and we just gave them the rules and we stepped back mm -hmm. and just said, okay, we're not going to tell you anything. We just want to observe you reading through the rules. And uh, the dualist was... The, the kind of outcome of that one. I think that's the most kind of standard that people... Well, that write. one I found kind of interesting because it's the one that relies a little bit more on a, a fictional interpretation of a philosophy rather than the philosophy itself, for one thing. Um, what the, the popular conception of dualist or Taoist or whatever is not necessarily what anybody who ascribed to it ever did. Um, and so the... So it's kind of an interesting... I want to know how it came about that they did that. Let's talk about that group. Do you remember what the characters were like in that group? And what they um, had done with one another and what the relationships actually were? Um, I do remember that that one, in terms of the world, it, it was the one that was the most kind of everyday, ordinary. Right. It kind of had a contemporary everyday setting and so that one i mean and and i would say that the the answers as as a result not that they weren't interesting but they were kind of more mundane i mean types of of answers like kind of more everyday kinds of mm -hmm. of conflicts like okay we were at a party right and uh you did you know you you revealed a secret about me right. that was embarrassing to me and you know well i i I see that. The I'm still not hearing much about siblings, murders, affairs, you know, uh, grief, um, that stuff. And maybe uh, not even that dramatic. I mean, maybe, you know, did anybody, you know, end up being married to another character, as we found out? That, yeah. that kind of thing. Okay, now, I mean, I, I can tell you that the, the fascist society, that there was, there was killing that had gone on and and uh we we found out that one of the characters had in fact been killed by by another character and that there were you know um you know one of the androids wanted to have uh some type of a affair mm -hmm. with uh somebody else but the 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 ruler <coughs> that that was strictly forbidden right, right, right. To, to be able to have such such relationships uh and so yeah you got those kinds of of interpersonal dynamics and you know one of the the questions i guess that i have is that when when those things start to develop when it's my turn to answer a question uh, we, we try to phrase the question so that they are mostly about you. But when they get into the re relationship questions, they necessarily then start to they allow have to implicate to other say, characters. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And so you are able to establish facts about somebody else's character. And um, I think that 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 makes it interesting and adds an interesting dynamic to the game. You have to embrace it or you can't play. Yeah, right. Yeah, but but like okay, so if somebody answers a question and they and they start kind of establishing facts about my character, that's also somewhat disempowering. Yeah, to me well, as, it's as it's definitely it's definitely a feature, um, and it is disempowering when you're not expecting it, um, or when you're not inclined to suck it up, you know, to say right. all right, whatever it is, you know, I'm going in. The less I make up before I hear the answers to some questions, the better. Correct. Um, however, that runs against a great deal of role-playing training, which says have your 100% rock-solid finished portrait of your character in your head before you even put down any numbers and stick to it. And so a lot of role-playing training focuses on that, or at least to pretend that you have, 
or to reserve the power to set up any such thing as we go along. Um, so it is potentially disempowering. The question is then, how is the game taught? Because without relationship cards, you know, it's half the fun goes away. Where are you going to get your content except from relationships? So uh, you could either turn them into differently phrased questions where perhaps more riskily they could be asked something like uh, what you know has anybody you know embarrassed you um, and then I guess you have the potential of saying no but even so if you say yes him it's the same thing all over again so it doesn't really solve anything um, the only thing to do is to say, okay, that's not a problem, and we have to accept that it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but yes, so there's a great deal of that going on. Do you, if I'm remembering correctly, you don't always get to every deck, or do you have to do you have to run out every single deck before it's you, over? You, you do have to uh, go through part of every deck, right? But but you get to a point. usually passage before you finish one though. Yeah. You can, yeah, and and usually in the play testing, because the the game really runs for about four hours, right? And uh, and it runs at four hours without exhausting every deck, right? Mm -hmm. So at some point you get you get an option of moving on. So you have to right. go to every deck, but generally speaking, you're not answering right. every single question that's on that deck. Um, I do wonder, you know. In, in the the conversation, especially of those cards that directly talk about relationships, um, I wonder if it would be worth taking a stab at rewriting some of those so that it was up to a player as to whether or not they wanted to implicate another player at the table right. in that relationship. So, like, I get one about the embarrassing moment but maybe phrase it in such a way that, okay, somebody caused me an embarrassing moment, but now it's my choice whether I want right. to. Well, as I said, it. that's possible, but the problem, if it is a problem, is that if the answer is yes, I do, then we're back to the problem that I was trying to solve in the first place. So, in, right. in other words, it's not really, it's, it's adding a little bit of vagueness, but it's not really, or an out. But if that is perceived as a problem, it should be gone. Mm -hmm. If it's going to be included, then it needs to be as le least waffly as possible, and the rules admonish you, suck it up. That's part mm -hmm. of doing this. You're going to have relationships, it's like at the outset, you know, you are going to have relationships with one or more of these characters, and those relationships are not going to be under your control, mm -hmm. creatively speaking. They just aren't. And so... You are not inventing this character whole cloth. You are discovering this character, and you might not like what you see sometimes. Right. Which, um, as I say, I'm, I'm only saying this not to interject what I think the game should have in it, but rather I think I'm trying to paraphrase what is in it, mm -hmm. is my attempt. Yeah. Uh, we, we, do say, we do say... Um, in, in our directions about how to answer the questions, we say, in your response, focus on revealing aspects of your own character's past. You may add secondary facts about other characters, but you should refrain from hijacking the characters of other players. Eh, yeah, but, but what on earth does that mean? If I say that, you know, you're my son... Right. If I say that, you know, you're my gay lover, if I say that, you know, you're... Uh, my, I say that you're my slave, mm -hmm. like legally. Um, all those things. I mean, there it are. Is that hijacking the other character or not? And mm -hmm. so there's really no way for. And, and since that, that's the trouble, the speaker can never assess that. It's only the recipient who can assess that. So therefore, but then if you say, well, is it okay if I make you my slave? Then you get that tedious negotiation where you're workshopping right. rather than playing, and that's awful. So yeah, I mean, we um, go on. Yeah, we yeah. go on and say if you feel that someone else has created facts about your character which you do not want in play, you have the right to veto those facts. Yeah, 
The question if is, you, the question you know. again is, that it's turning the situation into ping pong right. rather than just having a functioning principle that you just got to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, uh, there, there is, and I, I'm, I may be slightly critical here. Metatopia and the Associated Play community, Game Chef, has been, and, and the Gauntlet, have all been, and, and th those overlap strongly, all of them, um, have all embraced a mode of play which borders on not playing and simply consensus storytelling. Um, and uh, some people are very, very comfortable in that, largely because they can always talk their way into or out of whatever they want. In other words, I don't consider it a very functional mode of play. I think of it as a way of dodging away from playing and being able to, you know, play paddle ball with everybody to make sure that you are staying comfortable. Um, and, uh, or in control for that matter. Therefore, the, the, the kind of, I'd like to do this. Is it okay with you? Yeah, I guess it's okay with me, but I'm a little uncomfortable with it. Oh, don't worry about it then. I won't do it. And this kind of yip yap, um, I don't think actually has a very positive effect on the, uh, the potential of the story to hit hard. Right. To mean something at the end when we think about what kind of judgments we're talking about. Um, everything has been so massaged through the process that there is no tension about what this means or whether we care and in what way. And so uh, so my tendency would be to say that, that this thing where you are going to have things said about your character... Um, that aren't under your control and that part of what we're doing here is to develop it is just a given. Now, it could be that the relationships have to wait a little. That maybe the relationships actually deck has to wait so that we, we get to know the characters through their activities or something first. Mm -hmm. And then that way we have things to work with things that you can establish about your character without suddenly discovering that you're a, you know, a three-eyed mutant out of nowhere mm -hmm. before you even get to say whether you like tennis or not. And so if we see a little work first, see a little activity first, then maybe the relationships are framed better and consistent with what we already know, and therefore it doesn't feel like a hijack. It feels like it's an enrichment. Yeah, or, uh, you know, I'm also wondering, um, because the way that the decks are right now, like, we have one that's the conflicts, and that's, like, super, super heavy on the relationships, obviously. You know, one of them is, like, happy times. Like, so these are, like, happy memories that you had of different things. But I, I wonder if another possibility would be to, to arrange the questions so that actually every deck had a, a more even mix of some questions that opened up relationships and some questions that right. were more just about the individual character so that you would be, you know, pretty much guaranteed that, that all of those types of questions would be kind of in the mix. Right. And that you, because right now it's, it's kind of random. It's, it's random, which, which deck you go. Right. To Cause first. you just roll a die and find out. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so but that, it, uh -huh. But yeah, if 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 you had, if we did a better job of kind of mixing up those types of questions, because even with like happy times, I mean, you 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 could you get relationships. Think, you get to define things like you know, mm -hmm. um, what you know, tell about a happy time we spent in a social situation or something. I mean, I don't know what the exact questions are. Well, there's a lot of content you can put in that answer. You can say yes at our wedding, right? Um, and so, it is. Uh, Here's the thing. Um, I don't know if this was planned or not, or if it's just my associations at work. But, and partly it's my, my darker nature that leans this way, which is that I can't help but be profoundly influenced in my thinking about this by Jean-Paul Sartre's No Exit, mm -hmm. um, where this is precisely what's happening, basically. 
and um, and the fact is they're all wretched, you know, miserable people, and we discover, you know, insofar as I'm not even sure if they ever quite find out what they did. Um, the viewer gets a pretty good idea without, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's not the kind of play that's going to, you know, hand you the cliff notes underneath itself. But the but it's pretty clear that we're dealing with a romantic triangle and that each one has made decisions and feels trapped in them and that they are basically uh, um, they were unable to come to any kind of notion in life uh, or before whatever this is um, that could have brought them happiness in any way, shape, or form. So, you know, the punchline, hell is other people, is, you know, pretty much the vote and the weighing right there for all three of them. And so, um, it, it's sort of, I mean, in this game, you don't have a single author who can regulate precisely the content so that they don't have to actually tell you what the backstory right. is. You have to have it. Um, but it's no less trenchant. It's no less... I mean, nobody in that room in No Exit knew who they were before they started talking. And none of them liked what they discovered about themselves, or about each other, for that matter. And so... Um, I, you see the see what I mean by my darker nature kind of leans toward letting this happen. Yeah. Um, even if the outcome is much more gentle or happy or uplifting or anything, the process is the same. You're discovering things that you really don't have any control over. And you are relying on the collective nature of interaction and the routines of interaction to generate them. And then you're taking, and you have to take on, even though it's not of your making, you still have to take on responsibility for them as a creator moving forward. Um, and that strikes me as a valid expectation. It's just uncompromising. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if that's, it is functional, I think, for the game, but it is also non-negotiable once established. And so, um, and that's why the kind of waffling of, well, you know, let's talk about how we feel about it if I say this, doesn't mm -hmm. strike me as functional in comparison. Um, so, again, food for thought. This whole conversation is food for thought, not direction right. on my part. So, Right. Um, yeah, and, and I guess, you know, part of it is also just making sure in the way that we phrase the questions that even those that... Uh, open up the possibility of establishing a relationship between mm -hmm. other characters, other players. Um, I think you can, if you're careful, you can phrase them so that the the weight of that question is still yes. on your shoulders. I was just right? about to say that, that, that there's two things, that two aspects to a question. One is, what is the factual content? The other is, what is the emotional implication of the content? and Or, or activity, for example. Um, and so, the, the question could provide one of those, but a badly written question would provide both. Because that's writing the story for you. Right. But if you phrase it just like you just said, then 50% of the content was not provided by any card. Right. And I think that's really the, the guiding principle of all your questions is, uh, is, is, yeah, equal content has to come from the way you answer it or the way that the other question jumps on it, but not textually. No, not, it's not all textual. Um, it's one of the reasons why the feud one kind of caught my attention. I was like, that's a lot of content being thrown in yeah. all of a sudden. Um, okay. So, uh, so okay, yeah, that's, that's actually a pretty strong principle for what we're talking about because, as you can see, if we were talking about something where it is a party game where, you know, some of us will go to heaven and some of us will not, 
um, then we would be perfectly happy with cards that carried most or all of the weight in content. Because, you know, we'll just draw another card, you know, and okay, right. oh, I got this one. And, you know, you keep going and we see who strategizes or who rides the waves or whatever, so they end up. Um, but in the kind of fiction that we're talking about, or the kind of aesthetic we're talking about, responsibility for what happens has to weigh with you. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, my games, Spiona or Shahida. I, I just um, got uh, Spione in the mail the other day. So well, fantastic! Yeah. Oh, in which case, yeah. you get to have the PDF too. Send me an email to remind me of that. Um, okay. But one of the features of both games is disclosure toward people at the table, um, and of material more or less about yourself that is probably a little alarming. Um, but it's done in, in specific ways. In Spiona, every person writes down on a piece of paper, two pieces of paper, uh, what's called the trespass, which is uh, when something that either you or someone you personally know has done, something that you or someone you personally know has done that you consider to be extremely wrong. And you write them down on two separate slips of paper. Everybody does it. Throw them into a hat. And there's only two principles in the story. You can play with as many as people as you like. In fact, it's built for a lot of people. Played with as many as 10 or 12, very functionally. But there are only ever two principles. Two spies. And they are pretty much the property of two people at the table. Doesn't matter who, but it's the same people throughout. And, um... Each of those people, when they pick their spy and they pick their guy, put them together, they have to put the trespass in between them. And they picked it at random. So then when you're playing, whether you disclose the trespass through play or not is up to you throughout play. And it has some mechanical implications if you do or if you don't. But the point is, is that the rule never says. There's never a rule of, okay, well, when you get this many red counters, disclose your trespass. That doesn't happen. Similarly, all the trespasses that weren't used are discarded in a permanent and unreadable fashion. So you don't get to see those other trespasses. Do you see how this works? It means that the disclosure of this information, first of all, is slightly massaged and that nobody is revealed to have provided that particular trespass. And number two, that, uh, and you can even do it. I've seen people do it when they bring printouts so that there can't be any handwriting evidence and stuff like that. That's fine too. Um, furthermore, that the disclosure of it on the part of the character is part of play and is at the option of that player and therefore the responsibility of having done this thing ultimately resides on the player almost as if they themselves have done it mm -hmm. and but they have to take responsibility for it actually being in there and in the fiction uh, well, it is in the fiction. The point is whether it's in there as a disclosed piece of information to other people. And it is uh, particularly powerful. I find that Spiona in particular puts people, especially because there's a great deal of paranoid unknowns in the story, and particularly because the characters are in an untenable situation to begin with, um... There is a sense of moral desperation that fits exactly with what these stories are. And so, uh, but I think that that comes, but the people feel very strongly about it because they know they're dealing with something that was real to somebody at the table. And that they have to make it real in terms of disclosure in the fiction to other people. But they'll be responsible for that. Mm-hmm. So it's it's pretty brutal in lots of ways, um, and so. But do you see what I mean about how 
that's why there isn't a little there isn't a little tab on the sheet that you move down and then when you hit number five you have to disclose nothing like that and so i think this game benefits from something of the same principle in saying if the card says that you and i resent each other why or i embarrassed you at a party and doesn't say how you feel about it. Mm -hmm. One way or the other, you have to bring in content that is going to be acted upon as fiction, just as real as the fiction that was said by the card. And then I think you're cooking with gas, actually, throughout the whole process. Um, um, And that actually may help with the relationships, too, because that way the card doesn't dictate everything about the relationship. Um, kind of interesting to see how many of the relationships, I keep saying relationship cards, that's not what I mean. I mean, I know that there are conflict cards, etc. What I mean is any card that does have a relationship in it. Um, Mm -hmm. For those, how many of them are you going to have the relationship in and of itself as content? Married, Mm -hmm. master and slave, you know, best friends, you know, mortal enemies, whatever. Um in a feud how many of them are going to have that and how many of them instead are going to have the emotional content and let you come up with the factual or social contextual content so those are those are opposites in terms of what a relationship is and the question is if you think one way to go is the best way and just have them all be like that that's one choice Or if you say, hey, I like both of those, but let's mix them up. So, you know, you can get one card that does it this way and one card that does it that way. Mm -hmm. Um, So, okay, that's, does that work as a principle, thought-provoking? Yeah, 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 it it does. And and I'm actually going to, I think what I have in my mind right now is maybe with each deck, they should roughly maybe be divided into thirds some cards that would not really be about relationships at all, but that, that you'd have one third, roughly one third that would be just, you know, facts about my character. Right. Right. And then, the, and then the, the other two thirds be kind of relationship oriented, but, but have them kind of divided up in terms of how, of which way they jump in that very correct. Way. Yeah. And so that, that uh-huh. you would get like, and and they're all shuffled up. So, right. right and they're, right. they're just pulled out. So you would, mm-hmm. you, you don't know like which, you know, you're going to be draw if it's your turn. You know, right. which one you're going to be drawing. Um, that sounds like a good model to play with, certainly, and it gives the deck a little more structure than it currently has right now, which is kind of going by the gut and finding out what happens, right. Uh, right. which was perfectly, you know, adequate for for the purposes. As the what what's the Shakespearean line? Sufficient unto the evil thereof, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's, um, but uh, anyway, the. Uh, the the other thing I wanted to talk about was in terms of some publication thoughts, and this is why I was so picky about the number of authors, and by which I mean not the original contributors, but the people who have executive power moving forward. Um, which is that right now, right now may be one of the worst times for role playing publishing since the bad old days of distributorship. And yet one would say, but Ron, this is a great time for publishing. You know, we have these huge communities of design and playtesting, these huge communities of people who are interested. This this should be the golden age. And I agree, it should be. But it is also the time when production value and deadlines are fetishized again. Mm -hmm. And so choosing to say, well, okay, First things first, let's get that Kickstarter going. Um, Has walked a lot of people just face first into the wall. And to the extent that a lot of the games that I'm seeing, many of which are lauded as the industry's hottest thing, really aren't very good at all. And they are making errors that we know are errors in terms of fundamental play activity. Um, there are multiple games, for example, in which multiple characters are taking action at once 
and yet the order and extent of those actions it's hand waved away oh arrive at whatever seems best which removes you know productive constraint from storytelling and immediately catapults you into workshopping um and yet all of this is lauded as collaborative so um there are games in which open collaboration and openness of what happens exactly can be very very functional but it has to be carefully and surgically interspersed with constraint uh, there are different kinds of constraint that doesn't all have to be order of outcome and resolution of outcome of tasks but it has to be something and so uh and i'm seeing a lot just just an example of the kind of thing that i'm that I, th I think this is very amateurish game design and yet you know since you made a zillion dollars in your kickstarter and it's got a gold gilt leaf because you reached a stretch goal you know and you got it out on time so everybody ordered it and it came on time well that's a big win in today's thinking it it, it is a time in which making the game available to people who want to play it is paramount because otherwise it'll get lost in the surf yeah and then there are those publication problems that I just talked about, which people walk into way too eagerly. So you asked on the Patreon a bit ago, and I know this might not be the place to talk about that. You asked me about whether I would still go with my anarchistic street corner pamphlet waving, scabby, you know, <laughs> homeless man approach to publishing um, in today's age. Well, it's a question. I mean, Jim Raggi in Finland has shown us that he didn't have to do it until you go back and look at how he started and you realize that's exactly how he started. And he labored with lamentations in exactly that fashion for at least five or six years before he went big with his Kickstarters and his high production. Mm -hmm. So the answer is yeah, to start. Yeah, I do. Um, and it is contraindicated by what everyone else will tell you, which is to whip up as much enthusiasm for as many people to contribute to the crowdfunding as possible and to get it out on fucking time and everybody will have it and you'll be lauded as this, that, and the other. Well, that's true. You might be, but that doesn't mean anybody's going to be playing your game. It's just another package in their mailbox. And how many social media posts do you see about people looking at all of those Kickstarter mailed in role-playing games that they haven't even fucking opened mm -hmm. so the the question to me becomes well as the maker of a role-playing game call me an idealist but in so far as you agree consider that some of us at least think that the goal is to have as many people who would like to play this game actually have it and are inclined to do so that that's really you know what what we're after and that high production and marketing does better to follow on the heels of establishing that than trying to front load it yeah. so it's not maybe the exactly the same answer i gave back in 2000 when getting into the retailer's store at all was you know even being a book at all this is before digital printing people forget that you know this is this is when you had to go to you had to go to offset printing with photographic plates um so you know times have changed that's true but dangerously making it easier to do is actually even basically means you walk off the plank quicker if you're not careful so exactly what you guys decide the three of you with your what are we going to do with this physically economically promotionally is that a word um, and otherwise, what are we actually going to do is a pretty good question. Mm -hmm. And the, in, in, in what appears to be something of a, of a golden age that didn't seem like it at the time between 2001 and 2012 ish, maybe when the distributorship fell apart and everybody knew it. So it was no longer even a thing. I mean, by 2003, we had consistent print-on-demand available. So I'd say from about there, K 
Kickstarter started, I think, before 2012, but it really became, like, fashionable, the thing, right around that time. So, uh, so right in between there, you can make your independent role-playing game, and you could print it nicely when and if you felt like it. However many copies you needed, whether you even wanted a print run, you didn't even have to. You just let it be print on demand. Mm-hmm. And you didn't have to promise them to anybody. You didn't have to make good on anything. You could take your time setting it up. You could let it lie fallow for two or three years, just if you felt like it. And that's okay. Um, you could, you know, it was, it was, it was nice. We seem to have lost that particular window. There was a window when all of that was the case. And all of us said, ah, good, okay, okay. We are now in the age of independent publishing where it's no longer, there's no infrastructural stress on making us do badly. Well, it's back. Mm -hmm. And it's also tied in with status in the so-called indie community. Which is... Do not get me started on status in the so-called indie community. Um, so, um, okay, yeah, that's enough um, preaching. Did that make any sense at yeah. all? Or yeah, it did. Um, you guys one question I have, just kind of um, moving forward, um, th the way we have the game set up now, there's actually a scale that is involved, right? Like, which adds a certain dramatic effect. Um, the one thing I like about the game is that, you know, we have it so that after people have answered questions, the other players who've been listening to make kind of judgments as to what kinds of virtues or vices, and they kind of step away from the table to a side table to, you know, basically mark their judgments right. on you. And you don't know what they are, right. which, which adds a kind of, it's based on what you have said, but, you know, how exactly they're interpreting it adds a, a kind of interesting level of mystery that's very fun to it. And, you know, when we've, I've, I've actually made myself a kind of crappy looking, right. you know, balance scale that is like sitting there because you know, it's a kind of visual reminder of like, okay, this is going on at the end. Now, in, in terms of the design though, I mean, should we ditch the scale? And I mean, there well, are that's kind of an interesting, there, there's two, there, there's a, there's an, unf I was, I've been thinking about this. Uh, there's an unfortunate reality that if the weights really are equivalent in weight, then the fact is people could just put tokens into the bag Correct. and hand you the bag. Mm -hmm. Because putting the weights on the scale is just a visual gimmick for the tally, for the vote. If, on the other hand, the weights, this is completely spitballing and not a suggestion but imagine if the weights were not equivalent and there was no way for the voters to know how much each one really was then you're adding an existential grimness to any you know to any of the you're adding a random factor into the vote um, and so you know you get the vote and you're like yeah you guys influenced it by your choice but you I might have just been screwed by having you know extra heavy weights on the on that one side um, again my philosophical biases lead me to think that that is delightful mm -hmm. but it adds a level of complexity that's not in your original design and so therefore I have no place even mentioning it for real mm -hmm. going with your original design Aesthetics of the scale aside, it literally adds nothing to the mechanic. It's just a dramatization. Right. In which case, making it part of the physical presentation of the game is very tricky because, I mean, a scale is not something that you just sort of have or don't have. <laughs> right. Right, especially like, right. like that old balance. Yeah, scale. yeah, exactly. And so, so therefore, it is, uh, at that point, I mean, obviously, you could manufacture them, distribute them, sell them, whatever, but it is definitely a gimmick rather than, 
you know, I mean, and, and I love the idea of like having it sitting there the whole time. That makes mm -hmm. perfectly good sense. But arguably, you know, you could have like the bag for the tokens sitting there the whole time too. Maybe not quite as visually dramatic, but yeah, you know, but it, but it's the really mechanically speaking, you're not getting much out of it. If you right. were, if there were a mechanical aspect to it that was a big deal, then it might be worth it. Mm -hmm. um, and the the game with the scale would then have some weight. But if you say, oh yeah, the game with the scale for some reason doesn't have that kind of weight. Yeah. Um, so either you mess with a mechanic in some fashion, the only one I can think of is the one I mentioned. Yeah. Or you don't, and mm -hmm. you have a visual scale on the character sheet mm -hmm. that you put the tokens on or write the tallies on, so you right. quote weigh it visually after you, you know, after you you fill it up, and that will suffice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, there, there yeah. still is drama to it. I, I think I that there's it. still yeah. drama to it doing it that way because the person who's who ultimately calculates the karma that you've built right. up is not you. It's somebody else. Right. So they're going to hand else. it to you. They're going to hand it to you. Or, they, or, to or they can reveal it to the table, right? right? They can hide it and then right. we go around and everybody right, exactly. does that. And so therefore, yeah, you're waiting to see what happened on your sheet. Right. Because right. you don't know what your tally right. is before mm -hmm. that. Yeah. So I think that that's, that's probably will carry the same amount without it being quite so painful. And then, of course, when some bright person pops up and says, we used a real scale with weights, and it was so <laughs> awesome. You know, you can say, what a great idea. I'm so glad that you dramatized the game at your table that way. Hey, everybody, that's cool. <laughs> and then, of course, somebody says, didn't you do that in the original? And you would say, oh, yeah, we thought about it, but I'm so glad somebody really did it. Really, that's your only option. I mean, yeah. it seems to me. Um cool well cool robbie i hope this was fun i mean i've yeah. gone over the oh yeah god so much to talk about why do you have to be so damned interesting um <laughs> the uh the i uh the 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 therapy question came to mind um because there have been a lot of games that are very much of uh, and and some of them but they were very they were these sort of dream-esque recovered memories do i don't i survive or do i succumb kind of uh of, of dream experience surreal games one part hell and one part phantom toll booth kind of things and um there's actually been a fair number of others whereby when you talk to the author, they say the purpose is for the people at the table to have a cathartic self-realization. In, in other words, the game is basically a dramatized form of encounter therapy. And then there are people who play other role-playing games who say that they find that to be the most important part of play as far as they're concerned. At which point I run screaming into the night because I really don't want any responsibility you know, unless I'm being paid and have been trained for it, you know, to participate yeah. in any such thing. But yeah. as we know, people can get very into this and bring it to the table as a desire. Um, in and, and of course, I write games which have disclosure and stuff like that. So therefore, yes, I have one foot in sort of that. But I, my proviso is, you know, enter at your own risk. Sort of the... the uh, the Mary Prankster's approach to acid rather than the Timothy Leary approach to acid. Um, and so at that point, I simply have to say, uh, it may be worthwhile to focus on the enjoyability of the fiction um, and that you insert your own... Well, it's a good question because people... I mean, part of successful fiction is that your own self or critique of self or unreflective presentation of self is involved. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
but it may be worth somehow pointing out that uh, the game has no purpose besides the production of fun fiction. Okay. Um, and I mean, maybe partly as a disclaimer, but maybe also to say, you know, look, if you're inclined that way, enter at your own risk. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was yeah when when you had uh, raised that that issue, um, I, I was thinking yeah I, I need to be kind of careful when I go through this and look at them because I yeah I, I do think kind of like uh, defining it or nudging the players in this idea that yeah what you're doing is creating a fictional character right and that yeah it, it would be I think risky <laughs> to <laughs> looking at some of the questions of like oh yeah if yeah. I was gonna answer this uh, actually and and make it autobiographical that would well that's why that truthfully part sort of caught my eye as well um Mm -hmm. and so your answer that it's truthful for the fiction going forward is well not to put it this way but it's the right answer for your goals (laughs) so that was kind of relieved um what, what i'm thinking about doing at this point is i i'm thinking about making some revisions to the cards and I would like to, for me to get another playtest group together, and I would like to videotape it, right, uh, right. and get their permission to do the videotaping. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I have that. You know, when we when we've done the playtest, we've been just kind of jotting down notes. It's but I think often it a little really surprising. Fun. I mean, I've certainly yeah. learned from my, my my filming of of videos of play videos this whole time. Um, as the player of any bug, you may have. Uh, you may have been surprised at yourself if you viewed that video at one point <laughs> or another. Um, and so uh, it, it's, it, it is well worth it for just that, just to see what real dynamics are happening or what passes over a person's face and stuff like that. But also things about the game itself that felt fine in play, like in design terms that felt fine in play, or like, okay, well, I guess it went that way. I guess that's how the rules work. I mean, look at how it went with everybody. And in retrospect, you're looking at it going, oh, that's terrible. That's not what I want in the game. And that actually has been pretty useful to me. Um, yeah. Yeah, sometimes I wonder how many people who playtested champions now are going to say, oh, I know how to play it. I was a playtester. And then they're going to read the rules and go, hey, that's funny. Everything I did, he made sure nobody could do. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, but, uh, but yes, so it's very, very useful. And I would love to, you know, I'm, I'd be more than happy to participate and play by screen at some point when and if possible, um, mm-hmm. as well. Cause it, uh, it's not a game that suits, I, I don't run off to find games like this mm-hmm. personally, but that doesn't mean that, you know, I hate them or I think they suck or I'll never play it or anything. And sometimes being taken out of that zone, my preference zone, is very, very helpful for me, too. Mm-hmm. Um, so, And particularly if you break my assumptions about that kind of play, that's yeah. that's exactly what I would say in a promotional sense of, you know, of, of saying that. Mm-hmm. It's pretty good promotion. So, All right, uh, I'll talk to you later on. Good okay, luck with great. everything. Take care. Great, thank you very much. Bye.